To master alteration, first accept that reality is a falsehood. There is no such thing. Our reality is a perception of greater forces impressed upon us for their amusement. Some say that these forces are the gods, others that they are something beyond the gods. Each school of magic harnesses the same power in execution. Whether you're tossing a fireball or walking on water, the resource that allows you to defy the predetermined laws of nature comes from the same place. Magicka flows from the realm of the Aedra, Aetherius, and it beams down upon Mundus through the sun and the stars. The very rifts left in the sky by Magnus the Architect and his Magna Ghi upon their withdrawal from the realm. With this in mind, the concept of magic schools seems arbitrary. If every spell turned from potential to reality by channeling the same resource, why bother distinguishing one school from another? Well, throughout history, magical institutions have sought the most effective means to teach students of the many ways magic can manifest. Schools of magic certainly make things easier. If a spell calls upon otherworldly entities from outside of Mundus, well, it's likely categorized as a conjuration spell. If a spell harnesses the elemental forces to harm a target, your tutor will guide you to the section of the archives dedicated to destruction. The issue with attempting to categorize magic is that it is impossible to limit such a mystical force to defined confines. No wonder the schools are constantly being amended and revised. A funny example of this comes from Barrow's speech to the Battle Mages, in which he suggests that destruction should be absorbed into the school of alteration, as dealing damage is no different to changing the forces of reality found in the domain of alteration. It's all a big mess. If we look at alteration, the subject of today's lesson, we can quite easily see that the description for this school does not come close to doing the school of magic justice. Alteration is commonly described as spells which alter the physical and magical properties of the target. Alteration spells harm the target by making the objects it is carrying heavier, and augments the target by making the objects it is carrying lighter, granting it elemental and physical shields, and the ability to breathe underwater and walk on water as well as opening locks. Think about this for a moment. Alteration magic has the potential to change the very foundations of physics and biology. It can quite literally defy the Adric earth bones and the laws of time and nature established by the divines. And if you look deep enough into the often overlooked school, which we will most certainly be doing today, you'll see that alteration masters are shaken to the very core by their studies, as alteration makes one reconsider reality. In understanding alteration, one must face a terrifying existential crisis. To a scholar who has mastered this school of magic, casting a ward or opening a lock is elementary and trivial. It is a profound understatement to the power of this manifestation of magic on Mundus. Hey guys, it's Drew the Daedrologist here and welcome back to Fudge Muppet. I've been a little distracted from my studies lately, what with the release of Fallout 76 in the real world. But I'm back on Tamriel now, and rather than being frowned upon by my scholarly peers for studying the Daedric Princes, I thought I'd tackle some less controversial fields of research, namely the schools of magic. To kick things off, we're going to delve into the school which I feel gets the least love by mages. In fairness, spells like water breathing, candlelight and oak flesh can make alteration seem rather mundane. But if we probe a little deeper, we'll soon see the immense potential of this school, potential which I firmly believe rivals that of the gods. To novice, apprentice and journeyman mages, alteration is seen as a nifty tool. With flesh spells, a skilled wizard can make armor obsolete. A craftier, more morally ambiguous caster can crack the most formidable strongbox, scoffing at the thought of fiddling with lockpicks. If channeled correctly, a mage could burden a target with invisible weight, causing them to grow exhausted with every motion. Come to think of it, that particular use would be great for getting jacked. Who needs a gym when you've got alteration magic? Such obscure implementations of the magic school seem to be the catalyst for battle mages to neglect alteration. It's endlessly fascinating to me how the information recorded on the topic of alteration can simultaneously say that the form of magic is strongest outside of combat, in the hands of thieves and assassins, while also claiming that alteration alters the rules of nature. How unbelievably short-sighted. When I first journeyed through Skyrim, I had the same misconceptions. I was quick to write alteration spell tomes off as frivolities, only useful for tossing heads of lettuce into buckets with telekinesis. In hindsight, I'm astounded by how underrated this school is. The effectiveness of alteration can be traced back to its first recorded usage by the Aelids. 
and this tale gives us some inkling of the potential this school possesses. The Aelids, though known for their cruel and sadistic practices, were undoubtedly a brilliant race and their fascination with starlight likely explains their magical innovations. With their Aelid wells and ethereal fragments, the Aelids understood the potential of lunar rays, and while there is no guaranteed confirmation that they discovered alteration magic first, it's a pretty safe bet to assume they did. When the Elysian Slave Rebellion was nearing victory over the oppressive Aelids, the city we now know as Braville, in the Nibbon region, was the final holdout for the Heartland Elves. The humans laid siege to their stronghold. This proved to be a long, gruelling siege, with the Aelids' resolve proving near impossible to break. On at least four occasions, the Elysians invaded the town, with seemingly positive results. But each time, without fail, the tides of battle turned with no logical explanation. By dawn, every human soldier was dead, and when reinforcements arrived at the gates, the town was repopulated by Aelid defenders. After the second successful invasion, the Elysians discovered secret underground tunnels, which they promptly collapsed to prevent another elven reclamation. The Centurions, convinced of their triumph, were baffled to find that, come morning, the soldiers were once again slain, and the city was once again held by the Aelids. Morale was unsurprisingly low after this. It was as if they were waging war with spectres, immortal beings that couldn't be beaten by the blade. It was no secret that the Aelids had an affinity for the starlight, but surely they were not gods when exposed to the twilight. Adamant that they would not be deceived a third time, the Elysian tacticians left no room for unwanted revelations. As they'd done twice before, the humans, led by Saint Elysia's mighty centurions, took the city by force. In open combat, the elves simply stood no chance. Legions were posted everywhere, outside of town, on the roads, and by the waterways, but no attack came. The following morning, the bodies of the occupying soldiers were tossed from the parapets by the Aelids. This is where one of Elysia's most trusted centurions came into play. This man was Teo Bravilius Tassus, the person for which the city of Braville was eponymously named. After being fooled three times, Bravilius was certain that the Aelids must have been hiding within the city walls, waiting until nightfall and then killing the soldiers as they slept. After invasion number four, Bravilius ordered his men to appraise every corner, every shadow, and all of this was done to no avail. They seemed destined to be evicted brutally from town once again, but Bravilius noticed two peculiar sights. High up on the city walls, well below the battlements, yet also well above climbing height, there were small indentations in the otherwise even surface. They looked almost like platforms. And inside the city, by the river, he noticed a footprint that wasn't imprinted by an imperial boot. It soon became clear that the Aelids had been utilising previously undiscovered magics to remain hidden within the city walls. Some had waited beneath the surface of the river, breathing underwater while others had levitated up to the concaves of the walls. With their secret strategies found out, the Aelids were dealt with once and for all. Just as the Sigic monks of Arteum are credited for the founding of mysticism spells long before they were organised into schools of magic, so too were the Aelids credited for the discovery of alteration. This would also explain why the Aelids were renowned for their ability to shapeshift, making it very difficult to rid Cyrodiil of the Heartland Elves. With the powers of alteration, the Aelids achieved much more than any modern gimmick. They weren't simply hardening their flesh, or opening locks, or getting swole. The immensely outnumbered defenders of Braville reclaimed their last holdout multiple times from a much greater force of superior soldiers. And this is where we can start to see the inconceivable potential of alteration. This school, which is all but shrugged off by academic sources and magic users alike, is described like this in the very same sources. It is easy to confuse illusion and alteration. Both schools of magic attempt to create what is not there. The difference is in the rules of nature. Illusion is not bound by them, while alteration is. This may seem to indicate that alteration is the weaker of the two, but this is not true. Alteration creates a reality that is recognised by everyone. Illusion's reality is only in the mind of the caster and the target. When you look at it like this, it seems like a no-brainer that alteration trumps illusion. Of course, illusion is all about perception, and how perception at the end of the day is more important than reality. But why bother tricking your enemy into believing something imaginary, when you can bend the very fabric of reality and bypass the tricking altogether? The book titled Reality and Other Falsehoods explains the mechanics of alteration like this. 
To cast alteration spells is to convince a greater power that it will be easier to change reality as requested than to leave it alone. Do not assume that these forces are sentient. Our best guess is that they are like wind and water, persistent but not thoughtful. Just like directing the wind or water, diversions are easier than outright resistance. Express the spell as a subtle change and it is more likely to be successful. Essentially, what the source claims is that by the very definition of alteration, you can use magic to defy the laws of nature, the rules which comprise the existence of the mortal realm. The creation myth of the Mundus claims that the original spirits who did not abandon Lorcan's creation, i.e. the divines in the other Elnafe, transformed themselves into the earth bones so that the realm could physically exist and not die. These spirits invested their power into the realm's foundations. Akatosh devoted his power to the creation of time, while Kynareff devoted hers to creating the elements. If alteration allows the caster to change the fundamentals of physics and biology, then alteration therefore allows the caster to meddle with the very power of the gods. If you give your skin the properties of an oak tree, sturdy and difficult to pierce, then you are actively defying and overruling Kynareff's domain. This is where the School of Alteration begins to tangle itself around the concept of Kim. We've spoken about Kim extensively on the channel, and I'm gonna go ahead and walk carefully around this rabbit hole. But put simply, we know that Kim, as achieved by Vivek and likely Talos, is the act of discovering that the universe does not really exist, that everything is a part of the Godhead's mindscape, that everything is imaginary. If one is confident or arrogant enough to persist in the universe with said knowledge, they have achieved Kim. They have become a lucid moderator of this dream server. When Talos transformed the jungles of Cyrodiil into grassy knolls and verdant plains, you can make the case that he was using his understanding of the universe to cast an enormously powerful and everlasting alteration spell. Becoming a master of the alteration school suddenly seems like a terrifying prospect, one that could drive any mortal insane. In casting their spells, they are learning how to change the very substance of Mundus. The materials used by Lorcan and the other Aedra when constructing the realm, the one reliable constant in this world, can be defied by any alteration magic user. The Elnafe turned themselves into the Earthbones in order to maintain a reality for mortals to exist in. And now, those very mortals have discovered a way to use magic to edit those forces. Alteration is dangerous. If a novice mage can defy gravity by burdening a foe, just think what a master could do with that ability. If a novice mage can turn their skin to oak, or an adept can turn it to iron, what's stopping a master from learning to turn every living thing to stone? This is why willpower is such an essential attribute in the Elder Scrolls. Yes, it improves your spellcasting and magical resistance, but for alteration mages, it is also the skill that would allow you to reconcile your existence in reality with the fact that reality itself is a falsehood. This is just me speculating here, but I think the reason we haven't come anywhere close to realizing the potential power of alteration magic is because the most promising scholars and practitioners cease to be when they are faced with their own existential crisis. I'll be honest, I'm almost afraid to research this school further, as I may just vanish from the mortal realm. But there you have it guys, the most dangerous school of magic, the school which contradicts everything that we mortals consider absolute and undeniable. If you didn't cease to exist after thinking too much about this topic, and if you enjoyed the video, let me know you're alive by leaving a like on the video. Let's call it a census for all of us with the willpower to tackle the field of alteration. Thanks so much for watching guys, my name is Drew, and I'll see you next time.